like to read something from Pastor Stephen Joyce. Some people want to live within a mile of a steeple or a church bell. Me, I want to set up a mission station one foot from the gates of hell. Good morning, Northwest Chapel. <laughs> I'm Lynn Roos, and like so many of us here at Northwest Chapel, I've had the opportunity and the blessing to serve many family missions teams with our church in Washington, D.C. about my father's business with Pastor Stephen and Rosie Joyce. Sometimes I've heard AMFB referred to as our sister church or our daughter church, which are both fitting because after all, they share the same DNA for missions, church planning and advancing the kingdom of God. When Northwest Chapel and AMFB get together, it's always a family reunion. We have a partnership built on the battlefield as well as in times of exuberant joy and renewal. AMFB and Northwest Chapel have always been partners. From the very beginning, when Northwest pa Chapel pastors Terry and Martin met with Stephen and Rosie about church planting within the inner city. Stephen and Rosie are natives of Columbus. They moved to DC in 96, where God's grace working through them, they planted the church about my father's business outreach ministries and three daughter churches within the homeless communities. Stephen and Rosie have also served as short-term missionaries with Northwest Chapel and AMFB in Haiti and Mexico. Through God's grace, they have led family missions teams from Northwest Chapel and other teams from all over North America <clears throat> into the DC area to help serve the lost and homeless by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands. They live by this statement, which is so true in the inner city. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They have witnessed the, the Lord transform murderers, prostitutes, and drug addicts into servants, saints, sons, and daughters of the living God. Stephen and Rosie are so blessed to share five children and 11 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren in their minds, life couldn't get any better on this side of glory. We're pleased to welcome Pastor Stephen and Rosie Joyce. I'm, I'm kind of sensitive. Um, so before I get started, um, last service, um, I was preaching the best I could, and I noticed that somebody had probably fallen asleep, fallen asleep during the message. <laughs> so I looked to his wife and I said, Sister Ishmael, would you wake your husband up? <laughs> and she yelled back, Pastor, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> Northwest, let me say this, Rosie and I, and everyone at AMFB, thank you from the bottom of our heart. It's not lip service when I say that if it wasn't for your financial and your prayer support, for your continuous encouragement, for the teams coming down through the years and, and doing missions together, we would not be where we are or maybe not even be in existence. So we want to give the Lord some hands. And, and I know you've got a lot going on here at Northwest Chapel, but I'm going to suggest that um, Lynn and Liz do a class on hospitality because they, they served us so, as Bob Evans, they served us so many, Jimmy Dean, they served us so many ways last night, we bound to like one of them. They treated us with royalty, got up this morning and, Lynn, just with a number, how many cheeses was in that, those eggs? I mean, he was naming stuff I never heard of. <laughs> he just, like, <laughs> but listen, thank you guys for uh, partnering with us, and we've been partnering. We're not visiting; we're family. We know that we're at home. Just thank God for each and every one of you. Want to give a shout out to my nephew and I'm sorry, don't want to stop missing people. Anthony, what's up, man? Yeah, <laughs> and your beautiful wife. Praise God. 
Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, your kindness, and your goodness to us. Now, Lord, we pray that you'd open up our hearts, our minds. Move us, Lord God. Take us from where we are and draw us nearer to your heart. Lord, your word tells us that we're to be transformed daily, 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 day by day, more into the image of your son. Move us from com being comfortable or complacent and help us to be more on fire for, for you than we have ever known. Please, Lord, we ask, I pray this, we pray this for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A man, some of you may have never heard of this gentleman. His name is, what? no, his name is still Tom Julian because God is not the God of the dead but the living. Tom died about a month and a half ago. And he had made an impact on so many in our fellowship. Tom Julian was a coach, a former missionary, a church, he did so much. He was a, uh, um, when he, when we ever would have our meetings um, at the corporate level, if you want to call it a corporation, I sat um, a time on the fellowship committee, and whenever Tom spoke, everybody listened. He was a prolific writer, an author. One of the books I read from him was called Revisiting Antioch. And Tom made this statement. He says, a missionary does not do the work of missions for the church but the church does the work of missions through the missionary. Tom wanted to make sure that there was never a disconnect between those who are doing spiritual warfare on the front line and for those who were at the local church. There was never to be a disconnect and they, they worked together even though they were working in separate fields. About my father's business, we rented a big old house. How many of you know what an intercom system is in a house? Okay, because your kids don't. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's got an intercom system in it. And I want to use that intercom system, the thought of one, to illustrate how we have, well, I'll illustrate why so many times the church is so weak in prayer. Because we've taken something, we've tried to make prayer a domestic intercom system, looking to always asking God for, I need a new car, I need new shoes, I, 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 I need a new husband. Um, I didn't really mean, did I say that out loud? <laughs> but anyway, we often take prayer and use it for creature comforts instead of what God designed it to be. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying for small needs, but understand, prayer is designed not to be a domestic intercom system, but a wartime walkie-talkie. Prayer is not just for our comfort. It's to be used in battle. How many of you know spiritual warfare is real? It, 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 it's real. See, prayer is designed as a walkie-talkie for spiritual battles. It is a link, if you would, for active soldiers linking up with command headquarters. Because from headquarters, there we get unlimited firepower. There is where we get air support, and there is where we get our strategic wisdom from. I say this to draw a picture to help us capture the spirit of prayer in our morning text. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, it reads this. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind, with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about the mysterious plan concerning Christ. That's why I'm in chains. Pray, pray 
that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. And let me give you the context of these words here in Colossians. Paul begins the letter to Colossians in chapter 1, verse 1, talking about he and Timothy. He goes on to verse 10 to speak about a man named Artichus who is in prison with Paul. Then he names a prayer warrior by the name of Ephesus, and he is from Colossians, his sending church. Now, picture these, these u- unique men. Let's call them God's special forces. They are in a spiritual battle to recapture the hearts of men for God. They made a strike at the enemy's lines and and, and they met counterforce. Paul and Archerchus, they're now prisoners of war. And it looks like that the enemy has gained a tactical victory. But somehow, Paul manages to smuggle a letter out from the prison camp. And he gets it back to the fellow soldiers in the the rear. That's at the Colossians, or to the church. And he asks them to get on their walkie-talkies of prayer. Get in contact with command headquarters. And ask headquarters to fire a missile that will blast open the prison wall, not just so they can get out, but that they will get, be able to continue on their mission. And what was their mission? To preach the good news of freedom in Christ, to preach the good news of forgiveness of sin, to preach the good news of freedom. So the point that I want us to focus on this morning is not so much as on Paul and Archicus, who is in prison, but I want us to focus on the soldiers at the church. I want us to focus on the soldiers who hold the walkie-talkie of prayer. I want us to see that it's crucial for the frontline success in evangelism. Now, I know that the analogy is imperfect, so let's go right to the text for a few minutes. If you've got a, there's an outline of the message um, somewhere. <laughs> there's an outline of the message in your handout they gave you. But understand something, the first thing that you'll notice, three things I want to talk to you about is Three things on how to pray, and then three things on what to pray. And this is all in the context of frontline evangelism support. First thing Paul tells us to do is to pray persistently. Verse number two, he says, devote yourself to prayer. The the Greek word here carries the idea to stay by or persist in. To occupy oneself with earnest diligence. One rendering um, said it could be translated, persist in the siege. Now, if you've read the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, we see something happens in the heavenlies that most people aren't aware of. We see Daniel rose up to pray. And God had answered the prayer, and he was sending the answer, but the prince of Persia, a demonic force, interrupted the force and began to do battle within the heavenlies and principalities to try to keep Daniel from getting the answer. And the Bible tells us that Michael the archangel had to come in and help him and do battle so that his prayer that had been answered in heaven but was delayed for days could get back to Daniel. I bring that to attention because, see, we teach our children to pray. But we need to understand that prayer is not child's play. It it is not child's prayer. Intercessory prayer is engaging in spiritual warfare. And when we get serious about prayer, when we begin at times to fast and pray, uh, Satan lines up his big battalions uh, for the battle. It is warfare. 
When we pray, we need the whole armor of God. When we pray, we need the Holy Spirit's help. When we pray, we need to fight drowsiness and distractions and discouragement. You see, prayer is, is not like your cell phone. In our cell phones, we communicate with one another. We, the more we use them, the more the power drains out. And then we've got to plug them in to keep them recharged. Because the more you use them, the weaker the battery gets. Prayer is just the opposite. The more you use it, the more power you got. The more you use it, the more it, is, it becomes more useful. And if you hang it up, it becomes weaker. We should never hang up the prayer line. When the Bible says pray without ceasing, stay connected. Stay connected. And family, let me say this. If you want to have a crucial role in, in the great spiritual warfare that is raging these days, if you don't want to be put aside as a useless soldier, you need to keep your walkie-talkie with you all, to die, all day. You need to keep it on the on position. You need to make sure that you're always listening to headquarters, asking headquarters, God, give me my bearings. Where am I at right now? Guide me through this minefield of temptations that's always coming at me. The second answer to how to pray in verse 2 it says, devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind. The ESV translate that continue steadfastly. New King James says be vigilant. CSB says stay alert. In classical Greek, that word was used to being on guard duty. First Peter said stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil, because like a roaring lion, he's rolling, rolling around seeking whom he can devour. How many of you were in the military? How many of you were not in the Navy? I'm sorry. <laughs> See, I wanted to join the elite branch, so I joined the Navy. But anyway, <laughs> in the military, whether it was the Marine Corps, whether it was the Navy, in, in boot camp, they train you for war. Okay? What they would do, they put you on guard duty or fire watch if you were a Marine. Okay, and, 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 and what would happen, you'd be on guard duty while the other soldiers were getting rest and recovering. So you're standing there with your weapon. What they would do, the chief petty officer or the staff sergeant, whoever it was, they would try to sneak up on you. They wanted to see if you were not watching, if you were not alert, if you were not being vigilant. They would want to sneak up on you and try to put you down. That way you couldn't let the rest of the soldiers or sailors know that a hostile enemy was approaching. I give that illustration because that's how Satan works. He knows the danger of a Christian soldier who knows how to use the walkie-talkie of prayer. He knows the danger of a soldier who got his walkie-talkie and is in constant communication with headquarters. He will try to put you down so you can't help the other soldiers. How many of you know that Christianity is not all about you? How many of you know that we are the body of Christ? How many of you know that we are to pray for one another continuously and to HBO, help a brother out? Okay. <laughs> We've got to stay in communication, encouraging and lifting each other up. And I'm going to tell you this, right? I told somebody this in the hallway a few minutes ago. The young lady right here in the red top, I'm, forgive me, I'm terrible with names. She told me she prays for me every day. And, and I said this, and I believe this with all my heart. If I did not have people who lifted me up in prayer constantly, my, every time my wife, my wife and I, before she tells me, I've already prayed for you, let's pray again. If I didn't have people constantly pray for me, I know that I would not be standing. But the devil is trying to get the soldiers away from their walkie-talkies. He'll try to put you down. He'll try to jam the airwaves with TV, with social media, 
with, with, with Facebook. He, he'll try to jam the airwaves uh, with entertainments. Uh, he, he'll try to steal the transmitter, uh, deceiving you, telling you that it's broken, that prayer doesn't really work. He tempts you to stay up late at night, you know, doing nothing. But when you get up the next morning, you're too tired to pick up the walkie-talkie. He does anything he can to keep you from using or getting in contact with headquarters. But let me say this. The only way that if we're going to get victory over the devil is staying alert. He don't take no days off. The reason I'm stressing it this way in an analogy, because I don't know of a better way to impress this crucial truth to us, that we must be vigilant in prayer because prayer is the driving force of our spiritual lives every single day without it. We're just sitting ducks. What am I going through? This happened. Woe is me. And the devil's just like, I know I don't read my Bible as much as I should. I know I don't pray as I ought to. Well, guess what? Why do you think you ain't getting hit like that? The third answer to how we are to pray is with thankfulness. It says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and with a thankful heart. You know, this world appears to be out of control, doesn't it? I mean, this world is out of control. But guess what? There are no power outages at headquarters. There's no energy crisis at headquarters. No matter how things appear, please know this, God is still in control. He is still in control. I want you to think with me for a few moments about some of the decisive battles that Jesus fought with the devil. It appeared after he was hungry, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, the devil came at him with everything he had in the wilderness, didn't he? It didn't appear to look good. It did not appear. If you were on the outside and you see looking into the Garden of Gethsemane and you see Jesus praying, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me in such agony that his face dropped, drops of blood fell from him. It didn't appear that when he was at the cross, on the cross, when he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? It didn't look good. It didn't appear good when they put him in the tomb. But three days. I don't normally do this, but look at your neighbor and say, but three days. (laughs) Three days later. Three days later, there was a rumbling. There was some angels. There was a tomb where the rock was rolled away. And somebody named the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, stood up. Death and hell were defeated. It didn't appear it was going to work. Death and hell were defeated. And then my my our Savior said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Now go make disciples. Then the Bible says that Jesus ascended to headquarters. And then he poured out the Holy Spirit. And understand something, he's at headquarters still running things. He's still calling the shots. And my Bible tells me that guess what? One day he's coming back. One day he's coming back and one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. See, understand something, my brothers and sisters, we are not losers. We're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from a position of victory. And you know what, I've read the book, Jesus Wins. So, woven through all our walkie-talkie prayers, there ought to be constant thanksgiving. 
You know, last weekend, we went out. We had a plan where we were going to go to do missions. But we stopped for a second, made a circle, and got on the walkie-talkies. We asked command headquarters, Lord, guide us where you want us to go. We had a plan. Lord, prepare the hearts that you want us to see. Lord, take, Lord, show us where you are working so we can join you in what you're already doing. And so we got on the road, and then we, next, then we turned this way. And then we went that way. And then we ended up in D.C., something, a place called Union Station. And what did we see just lining down one in the cut? were drug addicts, homeless men and women, folks living in tents. And we told some of the team members, stay in the vehicles and use your walkie-talkie. Stay connected to headquarters and you pray that God gives us victory. So we went into the enemy's camp and we watched airstrike after airstrike after airstrike. We watched the blinded eyes open. We watched hearts being encouraged. We watched stony hearts being softened. We watched some of them cats start quoting scripture because they had been, they were the one that had left the 99 and they were praising God. And then when we got back to the father's house, that's what we call it, we had to debrief. And our, our Thanksgiving, if I may paraphrase, went something like this. Nice shot, Lord. <laughs> Lord, that one was off the hook. You blew those doors wide open. Lord, we called in for an airstrike. Lord, you, oh, you always hit your target. You always hit your target. I believe when Paul says, with thanksgiving, we can be praying about stuff and then God gives us a victory and sometimes we forget to thank him. So we got to always, when we see God moving, Thank you, Lord. You did it again. Now, in verses 3 and 4, Paul tells us at least three things on what to pray for in support of frontline evangelism. He says, pray for the special forces. He said, pray for us. God has called some of us to be, to give most of our time in direct gospel warfare. Now, all Christians, all Christians are soldiers. All have the walkie-talkies. Now I'm talking about the priesthood of believers. We all have access to headquarters. But there's a differenti differentiation in assignments on the battlefield. You see, Ephesians 4 said he's given some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers. We call them again the special forces. But we need to make sure that we are lifting these special forces teams up in prayer continuously. You know, when Pastor Mike gets here, he should walk into a church, the new pastor of Northwest. He should walk into this building and just feel the Shekinah glory. So anointed, so filled with prayer, praising God and thanking him because God's man is coming into the house. I mean, there's been a void in leadership for a minute, but look what God is doing. And, and, and you know what? You got missions and missionaries uh, who are constantly out there doing battle. Keep them lifted up in prayer. Northwest, uh, you got Betsy and Castan, Tony and Kathy Webb. You've got uh, John and Mindy Baker in Mexico. You got Bruce and Jan, Sylvester in Albania. I'm sorry, Jim and Jan in Albania. You got Bruce and Lisa in Brazil and Chad. You got Mar Mario and Margarita in southern Mexico and in Cuba. You got Martin and Christy now doing Vision Latin America. You got Kelly well, in doing a campus crusade for Christ. You know what? Remember this. The missionary does not do the work of missions for the church. 
but the church does the work of missions through the missionaries. Oh, they should be bathed in prayer. They should be strengthened continuously. What to pray? We need to pray for gospel opportunities to open for the special forces. Verse 3 says, pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak concerning Christ. Paul is aware there is a difference of just talking about Jesus and then seeing an opportunity to talk to a lost man or woman about Jesus that they might be saved. He's saying open doors. We pray that God would open doors so they'd have an opportunity to preach the gospel to those who are lost. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 2.12, When I came to the city of Troy to preach the good news of Christ, the Lord opened a door of opportunity. And then in Revelations 3.8, Jesus says this to the church of, of Dublin. Oh, it says Philadelphia. <laughs> I know all the things you do. I've opened a door for you that no one can close. I believe that God has given Northwest Chapel an open door. I believe this because I, I'm, I'm told about all the life groups that you have, all the discipleship programs, AMF, the ABF Sunday school meetings, the men's study groups, the women's study groups, the student ministries, the children's ministries. I understand something. These are not designed just so we can be fat and happy Christians. These are designed that we might be disciples to go make disciples. You know, Jesus said, follow me. Didn't he say that? He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So if you're not fishing for men, are you following him? I'm just saying. Please understand something. One problem, the crisis that we've got in the country while our country is going into a cesspool is because oftentimes we, and I'm talking about me, we're not on our job. So, I believe God's given us an open door. An open door from D.C. to Dublin and throughout this world. But we have got to be soldiers who are obedient to our commander-in-chief. And we need to start doing what he's called. I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do. I'm going to tell you why. I had a, a, a former missionary who was a missions pastor at some church in Philadelphia. No, Pennsylvania somewhere. I don't know. But he called me one day. He said, Pastor Joyce, we want to come down to your church and do missions, but we got a problem. I said, okay. He says, none of us have missionary training. They don't know how to do it. I said, really? I said, let me ask you a question. You know John 3, 16? He said, yeah. I said, do your people love Jesus? He says, yeah. I said, you're qualified. We've got to be on mission. Make it, we, got to, we all must be disciples who make disciples. What to pray for? That the mystery of Christ be made plain. Colossians 4, 3 and 4. He says, pray for us too. That God will give us many opportunities to speak again uh, about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That's why I'm in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. I'm just smiling because Paul says, I'm in chains. Pray that I make it clear. <laughs> you understand something? The gospel is a mystery, not because it's confusing or a tricky riddle. It's a mystery because only God can reveal it and make it plain. And God has done that, and he's doing that through the church. You know, two days ago, I had a guy tell me that a friend of him told him that man wrote the Bible, wrote the New Testament. Pastor, what do you think about it? I said, I think about it. I think your friend's an idiot. <laughs> I, I did. I, I said, I think he's an idiot. He has no idea what he's talking about. Because there's no way. You know, we all heard some stupid stuff about where the Bible came from and who wrote it. Look at the mystery of God. Who, who's going to write this? 
Here's God's mysterious plan. That the Son of God would become a man. Nobody would have thought that. That the Son of God would become a man and then live a life of poverty and love. Who would have thought that? That he would die in the place of sinner, sinners and bear the curse of the law, but he didn't have any sin. Who could pin that but God? And then how about that he would rise from the dead and, and, and reign in heaven one day? Who would have thought it? How about this, that the ungodly would be justified not by works but by faith? How about this, that the Jew and the Gentile, black and white, red and green and tweed, would all become one in Christ and we would be together in him as the body forever? Or that, 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 that one day he would dwell in our hearts and seal us for his glory. Who would have thought that? See, that's what evangelism is all about. That's what missions is all about. You know, so many times we, 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 we look at these great miracles of God that nobody could have come up with but God. He made it plain to us. And he said, go tell somebody. You want, drop some knowledge to them, some real heavy stuff. But even if you tell them, they ain't going to get it unless I open up their minds. And again, we're back to prayer. We're back to prayer. No one could have dreamed this stuff up. They are the mystery hidden in the ages in God, but now made plain to us. I'm sorry, I just want, I got a question. Ain't he awesome? Yeah. Ain't he awesome? Uh, let, let me close. In three letters, Paul wrote this, reminded the people. He wrote it to the church in Ephesians. He did it in the Philippi, Philippians and Colossians. He reminded them of his limitations. But he would not let his limitations stop him from ministry. He gently reminded all three of these churches that I'm in chains. Maybe, maybe he reminded them that he was in chains because he may be saying, hey, you know, some of y'all think y'all got problems and you can't share the gospel. But look at me. I got big problems and it's not stopping me. Don't ever let your problems stop you from telling somebody the good news of Jesus Christ. I might be bound in chains, but the gospel cannot be bound. The gospel cannot be bound. Nothing should keep us from telling others about Jesus. H.A. Ironside wrote this. How natural it would have been for him to give up in, his dis in despair and settle down in utter discouragement or simply to endure passively the long weary months of imprisonment, taking it for granted that nothing could really be accomplished for God as far as gospel fruit was concerned until he could get free. But he was of another mind entirely. His circumstances did not indicate to him that God had put him to the side, but he was looking for fresh opportunities to advance upon the enemy. How many of you know people who've been in the hospital and they share in Jesus with people who come into their room? How many of you know people who are in wheelchairs or paraplegic and they, and they love Jesus and make, make people with two feet or three feet look bad? I mean, we should never, never let our circumstances prevent us from telling the good news. Because, you know, I was talking, I guess he was part of the welcome team, a guy named Ben, 
a little earlier, and he was so encouraging. And, and I said, you know, Ben, sometimes we treat earth like we want it to be heaven, but this ain't heaven. This is nothing but a proving ground of who we trust in. This is a proving ground where we trust, where we take God at his word, because heaven is the land of no more. That's when we will have no more sickness, no more hunger, no more pain. But that's not today. Today, all of us are to be about our father's business. Because, we're again, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. You know, this little gadget here, we look at it all day. We're checking it constantly for text. Get up in the morning. Some of us, first thing we do, let me see what's in the account. We're on... We're looking on Twitter, on Facebook, and we say it, lay it down beside our bed when we, we get ready to go to bed at night, and we put it back up in the charger because we didn't ran the juice down. I wonder what would happen if our walkie-talkies were more important than our cell phones. I wonder what would happen if we began to pray without ceasing, always in touch with command headquarters. I wonder what would happen when the mailman comes by and you see him, Lord, please be good to him and help him send somebody his way that he might come to know Jesus. How many, what do you think would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. I believe with all my heart when the people of God start using their walkie-talkies, staying in contact with headquarters, then you're going to have some real revival. Then we're going to see some sons and daughters saved then we're going to see some of the murderous race start to go down because you know how we defeat the devil get folks saved and prayer is something you know it blows my mind that God in heaven has linked his, his activities to the prayers of the saints oh, I'm sorry he has linked much of his activity to the prayers of the saints. So family, when we leave here, remember the more you use the walkie-talkie of prayer, the more power that you have. Let's give the devil notice and let's be about our father's business, praying without ceasing. Amen.